Okay, good afternoon. I'm Tanya Gross. I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the Open Textbook Network. And I'm joined today by two of my fabulous colleagues, uh, two instructors for the Certificate in OER Librarianship, Cheryl Coulier, who's uh, the head of the mentor of the Beatles cohort, and Lily Tadornova, um, who is the mentor for the Beach Boys cohort. And with that, I will turn it over to you two um, to talk to us today about camp campus partners. Excellent. Well, welcome everybody. We're so glad you could join us. Um, today we're going to be talking about ways that you can partner with various campus stakeholders. Uh, the list that we're going to share is not exhaustive, so I encourage you to be creative in thinking about which other potential partners on your campus you could uh, work with. And since we just have an hour, we won't be able to do a deep dive into each one, but uh, we wanted to present kind of um, on our campus examples uh, of what we're doing and then save the last half for an opportunity for you to share what you're doing on your campuses in these different areas and we'll we'll have you chat, uh, type those comments into the chat, and then we'll compile them into a Google Doc that can be a working Google Doc for people to add comments and questions and share resources, share links. So um, we hope this will be a, a place where you can get some new ideas for how to work with campus partners. So I will get started. And I guess it's not going to, okay. Uh, so the first campus partner I want to focus on is the bookstores. And we're fortunate at the University of Arizona that we have a campus owned store. And, but I, I do know that people have been able to work with their Barnes and Noble and Follett stores. Uh, so I encourage you to set up a meeting and form that partnership and explore ways that you can collaborate. Um, for us, it, there had been a history before my time of, of some mistrust between um, leadership in the, the bookstore and the library. And we found what really built some great bridges was to do a joint pilot. Uh, we tested an e-textbook reader platform and the pilot was a disaster but um, it really bonded us <laughs> over all of the frustrations with this particular platform and really solidified this uh, the relationships between um, all of these different campus partners who became the founding members of our OER action committee so I, I highly recommend doing a pilot to, to build those bridges uh, we exchanged data and referrals, they, on the textbook adoption form uh, for faculty, there's a checkbox that says, I don't require textbooks for my class. And the bookstores share all of the textbook adoption information with us uh, each term. And uh, so I can go through and check with those folks to see what they are using, whether it's OER, sometimes it's a pirated book. Um, but whatever they're using as an alternative, it's a, it's a good um, educational process <laughs> to find out about OER that I wasn't aware was in use or um, to redirect them to non-pirated materials. Uh, we, they also refer, uh, we encourage faculty to put on the textbook adoption form that they know uh, a book is available through the library as a multi-user ebook for free. And so that helps the bookstore um, kind of determine how many print copies to buy. Uh, we invite each other to sales pitches that we get from vendors. So they'll let me know that they were contacted by Cengage or Top Hats. Um, we'll try to jointly at attend webinars so that they can hear what we're being pitched and we can hear what they're being pitched. And we also do joint presentations to campus and trainings. And that's been really useful to kind of present a, a united front in terms of all of the, the different options that are available to faculty. And on our campus, we try to frame it as a spectrum of affordability options. And so I always start with OER, um, but then we also talk about library licensed options. And then we do cover inclusive access because it's a, it's a big thing on our campus. 
uh, gives us a chance to um, address the pros and cons so that faculty are hearing those from us rather than the, the textbook uh, vendor. Uh, so those joint presentations are really helpful and we've had the opportunity to work with a newly formed college, uh, our vet med college, uh, to really get on the ground floor of their course material uh, and, and curriculum adoptions uh, as they choose things. And so we've been able to work collaboratively with the faculty in the bookstore. And so far, 80% of what they've selected has been uh, or will be available for free to students through library licensed materials. Um, we're also integrated into the student book list. And so for each required textbook, there's a link they can check that says check UA library for ebook and it'll say yay, the library has it or sorry, that's not available. Uh, we try to link to each other's websites and when I get inquiries, I always emphasize the bookstores textbook adoption process because so many faculty are unaware of that and it ends up helping the bookstore it ends up helping students and it ends up helping us because we can get the list of, of textbooks that have been adopted faster. And then uh, the bookstores and the libraries also report uh, savings figures jointly. And so that uh, involves some alignment of how we calculate those savings figures. Uh, so they report inclusive access, we report uh, ebook, library ebook savings, and then we also report OER. So those are just some ideas of ways that you can collaborate with your campus bookstore. Um, I should say that we also um, invite each other to our conferences. So our assistant bookstore director came with me to open ed to do a roundtable discussion in 2017, which was fabulous. And I go with them to the textbook affordability conferences. Uh, it's online this year, but it's been a good way to, again, build that partnership, build that trust, get to know each other so that those clear lines of communication are there. So the next category is instructional support. And so this, was, this would include instructional designers, um, whoever does your online uh, learning and course design, uh, maybe your faculty uh, professional learning, uh, whatever it's called. Uh, on ours, it's our uh, Center for Assessment and uh, Instruction. Uh, but whatever that center is called that helps faculty. Uh, partnering with them is, is really great. Uh, we jointly collaborate on webinars and workshops. They have a central calendar. And especially when the COVID pandemic hit and all of a sudden instructors were really uh, wanting information about how to move their courses online and uh, finding out about free resources and OER, we really tried to partner on all of those communications and have a central place where faculty can look for webinars, find the recordings to those. Uh, send out joint emails and that's been really effective because I know I, I'm at e email overload and I'm to the point where if somebody sends me an unnecessary email, I'm just flat out annoyed. Uh, so we definitely don't want to overwhelm faculty with communications. So using existing communication tools uh, and, and partnering with other campus units, I think is a good approach. Uh, we've also connected with the existing faculty learning communities on campus. And so we had an OER, we called it a professional learning community because we didn't want to limit it to just faculty. We wanted to also include uh, instructional designers, program managers, uh, but the OER uh, learning community ran last year. This summer, we're doing one on um, Pressbooks. And there was a really good OTN su summit session just this week on uh, faculty learning circles. And I know the recording is on the OTN YouTube website. So I highly encourage you to check that out. There was some really great ideas there. Uh, again, we refer to each other and consult each other, uh, especially when a new class is being uh, created or a class is being redesigned with instructional designers, it's a great opportunity to insert OER or other free to use course materials. And then we also try to link to each other's resources. So now I will pass things over to Lily. Thank you, Cheryl. 
Um, so here we just wanted to address some possible collaborations with uh, central university units that have to do with technology. So the, the two that come to mind primarily are the registrar and the office of Assess assessment or its equivalent, you know, whoever does the um, end of the semester student surveys. And so in terms of the first one, you know, I know there's a lot of interest in um, working with the registrar so that when students are signing up for a course, they can actually see the price of the course materials and the associated um, auxiliary materials in their courses. And many universities have done something like this. So we know that there's a way to be for that to be done, uh, but how do you go about it? Well, the first thing um, to find out is the actual system, what system is being used. In my case here at Rutgers, we are lucky, that's the wrong word, um, because we use multiple systems to do everything. So in the registrar, um, in the case of the registrar, we actually have a separate system for course lookup and for registration, which means that when students are making their schedule, their weekly schedule of classes, they're not looking at the same system as what they would be using to sign up for the class. Um, ideally, those two systems should talk to each other but that doesn't necessarily always happen either. And so the first thing to figure out is, what is the system that your registrar is using? Um, is it just one system or multiple ones? Can they be uh, linked with each other? Um, and if not, and I don't think Rutgers is, a, is the only place where they can't be, uh, maybe just consider prioritizing, like which system do you think uh, would help students the most in terms of helping with that goal of, them being able to see some transparency in terms of as they're signing up for classes. Um, the other thing that's a big one to consider is to break it down. So do you want them to identify OER courses um, or do, do you want them to find um, affordable or mixed content one as Cheryl was, was saying in, in her slides um, at Arizona and at Rutgers, we use a very broad approach. So we use, we, when we talk about affordability, we include OER, we include a lot of other things. Um, so maybe, you know, if you're making these course markings, you could create labels so that you're more accurate when you're describing um, the course materials in a course. Uh, the big thing here is to also define a low cost, right? So what is a low cost course? That's a very subjective term, you know, for some student, um, you know, $25 might be low cost, maybe not, depending on what's happening. And so usually that number is defined somewhere around $25 to $60. And actually some states like I know Louisiana and Washington have defined it in their own OER legislation. Um, but in a lot of places, it's pretty ambiguous. And so it might be up to your institution to say, this is what we think is a low cost course. Um, and again, just, I think I mentioned that, but just to remind you that it's not really just the textbook. There's a lot of other materials that are required for a course, such as auxiliary materials, really expensive clickers and homeworks and all kinds of things. Um, so just because there's no textbook doesn't necessarily mean that the course is doesn't cost anything in terms of course materials. Um, getting student support here, I think is critical, which is um, what I mean by advocacy there, because, you know, the registrar, of course, wants to be collaborative with the libraries, but it's a different story when students are coming to the registrar and saying, we need to know how much our courses are going to cost, right? That's a much stronger um, urgent message. And so one of the things I found effective uh, for me is to work with student government and to say, hey guys, you know, did you know that uh, the registrar could actually provide these course markings? And that would help a lot of students out. And so having the students understand uh, these options and advocate for them is really compelling. Um, there is a something I've, I've mentioned here in the slide, which is marking open and affordable courses, best practices and case studies. It's an upcoming, upcoming press book open, of course. And I don't know that it's quite out yet, but it will be. So if that's something that you could take note of, because it goes into deep dive in terms of uh, all of the different ways in which you could go about this uh, particular collaboration. So um, another system that you could approach and uh, that you know has been approached is uh, working with your office of assessment or institutional assessment, whatever it is that they're called. Sometimes they have very fancy names. Um, but maybe to add a question in the student survey in the course evaluation about course materials. Usually there's some kind of a, a question about course materials, like were they sufficient, were they engaging? 
but rarely do you see um, something about cost in, in that situation. And so perhaps that's something you could approach. Um, obviously, you could also advocate with individual faculty to be doing their own surveys and to be asking students these questions. I think that's reasonable too. However, it's obviously a lot harder to come up with, um, uh, to collate all of that information in an, in an easy way if you're asking individuals to do it. Um, so that's all I have for infrastructure. All right. Oh, and now we're moving on to student government and uh, the PERGs. So, so I've already addressed one way you can leverage your relationship with uh, student government, which is to, you know, have them apply some pressure, um, reasonable pressure, right, on the registrar or other systems if they're for some reason unwilling uh, to uh, create these course markings or make affordability more transparent. You could you could do that through the student government. Um, of course, there's other ways you, uh, other things you could do as well. You know, obviously, student government has a lot of uh, leverage on on the campus, right? So they have access to students. They have access to students' stories about affordability, which uh, of course can be very, very important. Um, they could ask student questions that librarians probably couldn't, right? Um, or that librarians might get different answers if if we are asking them versus a, a fellow student was asking them. Um, so they have a lot of abil availability. Um, they, have a, uh, they have a very captive audience and they have uh, a lot of ability to create these student stories if you need them on your campus and maybe even some data that you could share about actual um, numbers of affordability and not just the national numbers and what we know from the literature, but local stories and numbers. Um, at Rutgers, one thing that we were able to do is um, actually work with our student government to um, have them contribute some funding towards our mini grants, course redesign grants. And so that has been a very, um, uh, well, it, it was a challenging project and I'll talk about uh, that's in the caveat, uh, but it's, I, think it's a, it, I think it's a good idea to pursue it because usually student governments do have some kind of a mandate to do something about, a, to, to be questioning affordability at the very least, right? They're the, they're the students that are involved with uh, fees and tuition and all those things. And textbooks are certainly part of the package of money that we spend on education. Um, and so if they're able to go in, you know, and contribute to an already ongoing textbook affordability program as opposed to trying to come up with something on their own, um, they might be pretty happy about that as they were in my institution. And so asking for funding is, um, I think, reasonable. It's a reasonable thing to ask. Um, it can be tricky because, you know, money is tricky and transferring student money to faculty mini grants, I found, was a little bit challenging in terms of the logistics and the sort of how that circulates. Um, but it can be done, you know, or maybe they can just give a general gift to the library that than the librarians would, you know, use towards OER affordability. Um, so the caveat here, of course, is it is not that easy to work with student government, not because they're not wonderful, really enthusiastic uh, group of students, but generally because of the turnaround process, right? So in student government, um, students don't really um, stick around very long. You know, uh, sometimes they have wonderful, very productive conversations with student leaders. And the next thing I know, they've rolled off their position and there's a completely different student there who maybe is not as responsive through email. We all know the thing about undergraduates in email, they just don't answer it, right? So, um, so I feel like it's important as you're, if you're gonna be investing time into this kind of collaboration to really build in some continuity, whether it is by working with some of the um, faculty who are also engaged in student government or maybe you can engage the, the PERG. So a lot of us work with PERGs, uh, public interest research groups that have a student chapter. And those typically have a very nice relationship with the student government. And so that's been successful for, um, for me at least, is to work with the PERGs who tend to stick, tend to stick around. Um, and every time I'm confused about who is a new student government leader, they can tell me. Um, and then uh, another thought uh, here, not necessarily on the slide, but you know, student government also, they have access to, or they have 
you know, relationships with the student newspaper, which is important, uh, and just the general media around the university. And so that's something you could leverage. Um, I had something here, you know, I, it's just to mention, because I have encountered it, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, which is to say that all of this can be a little bit political. And so uh, it can be viewed as a little bit of a political move to be working with your PERG, right? So just be aware of that. Uh, that might be not, maybe not, isn't a perception everywhere. Uh, but you know, these are very passionate students that have very, very important causes that they're working on. And you might encounter some faculty that tend to disagree with those causes, right? And so when they associate you, associate you with the PERG, that could cause problems. I think that's okay, personally, uh, but just be aware that just like everything else, politics is involved. And Thanks, so. we can talk about Senate, more politics. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll add in a couple things about um, working with student government on our campus. One, uh, we referred them to the PERGs um, to work on an OER resolution and they just ran with it and uh, created it last spring. It, it's not exactly how I would have advised them to do it, but that it's theirs and it's done and that's awesome. Uh, this year we happen to have stu two student regents uh, on the board of regents for our state who were from our university and we worked with them on the idea of course marking thinking that it would be um, better coming from students than from the library um, we we didn't get a lot of traction with that before the pandemic hit um, but it's something we'll keep pursuing and then i have heard of other campuses that do student uh, driven oer awards so that's another idea you can look at Let's see, this does not want to advance. Okay, so um, faculty governance. Um, I've been involved in our faculty senate for the last, oh gosh, six years. And we're a big campus, 40,000 plus students. And I know some of the, the members of the Beatle cohort were able to book appointments with their provost and, and get a meeting. That would be impossible on my campus. This is the closest I'm ever going to get to our provost and president is uh, faculty senate meetings. But at least we have that. And I can also, you know, they can recognize my face. Uh, I have access to influential faculty. Um, the, the folks who tend to be the movers and shakers on campus and kind of the faculty champions. Uh, as a member of the Senate's uh, Student Affairs Policy Committee, I've also been able to be involved in projects to revamp our textbook policy and rewrite the faculty handbook. So that's been useful. Um, there may be other committees on academic freedom or promotion and tenure that you could get involved in. Uh, we currently, the library's dean is chairing a, a kind of an open access committee that's working to get open access in our promotion and tenure guidelines at the university. Uh, they made a strategic decision to separate OER <laughs> to avoid confusion between open access and OER. So first they're pursuing open access. Uh, but the University of British Columbia does have OER specifically in its promotion and tenure guidelines. And so they're a good example um, of, uh, of a place that's been able to specifically incorporate that. Uh, with us, what we advise faculty is to demonstrate impact. Uh, the university has a very broad idea of uh, scholarly uh, contributions. And so uh, the key in their dossier is really to demonstrate the impact of what they've done. And it, you know, there's all kinds of ways you can do that with OER from you know, student success metrics to, hey, we created this textbook and it got X number of downloads. Uh, so focusing on the impact as a way if you don't have it explicitly uh, called out in promotion and tenure guidelines. The next group of uh, stakeholders, uh, disability resource centers. And I find that these are often overlooked in action committees or task forces. Um, 
that deal with OER or affordability on campuses, but they're a really important partner. Uh, we actually uh, were able to help each other during the COVID pandemic when a bunch of students left their textbooks behind in their dorms. Uh, and that's when our university announced, no, don't come back to campus. And so they were stuck. Um, and the, the Disability Resource Center had already arranged for some copies of uh, PDF copies of certain textbooks for uh, print disabled students. And in some cases, we were able to make a fair use argument um, to share those with other students because they they purchased the book. It was just stuck in their dorm room. Um, so that's one collaboration possibility. Uh, we've had them test a variety of platforms and tools for us. They used to have a blind employee who was awesome. He would get on his screen reader and he would find all kinds of flaws with our various platforms. And, and we would actually connect him with the vendors to improve things. Uh, we've done a bunch of joint trainings between the library and um, accessibility uh, experts. We exchange information a lot, you know, hey, this webinar is coming up, or hey, pay attention to this lawsuit. Uh, I forget which piece of software it, it was was targeted. It was a particular piece of courseware for math, uh, and they got sued. And we were able to share that information with our, our math faculty to say, hey, you know, there are some open alternatives that haven't been sued that you might want to consider. Uh, and we also link to each other's web resources. Now I'll pass it back to Lily. All right. So this one might be a little bit of an outlier. Um, but I do think it's, a, it's one to think about uh, because I know that a lot of university and college campuses have some kind of a student support unit that helps uh, students who may be first generation, uh, maybe have some uh, additional financial needs uh, or in other ways are at considered to be at academic risk. And so um, at Rutgers, I think we have something called the Equal Opportunity Fund that students have to apply and show some financial need for. Um, we also have a cohort of student leaders that are first generation in their families. And so those are the ones that are available at my institution, but I would be, you know, curious to hear what other iterations are out there. And I just think it's one that's important to explore um, because obviously there's some overlap there ideologically uh, between, uh, you know, the university helping the students uh, financially, whether it is by providing them free textbooks, which is what the Equal Opportunity Fund does at Rutgers, um, and what the library might be wanting to do, which is to reduce the cost of, of course materials in whatever uh, shape or form you're working on that. So one step that you could take um, with a unit like that is perhaps um, work with uh, whoever is doing the student advising and uh, maybe give them a list of courses that you already know. You already know the faculty are teaching um, either open or affordable content. Um, and just so that you're sort of steering these students uh, in these groups uh, to courses that are excellent courses, pedagogically innovative, and happen to um, have a low or no cost. And so that's one um, example. And like I said, it's a little bit of an outlier because I don't know, haven't really seen a whole lot in the literature about it, but I would love to hear more from the group about this. And so in the spirit of that, so I think we want to turn it over to you and uh, see what you've been doing. Yes, now it's your turn. So uh, what we'd love you to do is type in the chat. We're going to have a series of question prompts coming up. Um, and we'll give you some time to uh, reply to those. This is the first one. What are examples of successful collaborations with your campus bookstore? Uh, go ahead and type them into the chat. and. Uh, we'll get a recording of the chat afterwards that will preserve people's names so that we know who made the comments. And we'll use the, the chat transcript to generate a Google Doc um, that we can then share out with everybody and you can continue adding to it and asking questions, uh, contacting people offline uh, who have a really interesting program that you might want to use on your campus. Uh, so, so go ahead and 
add uh, your suggestions or questions to the chat. Bookstore representative on your OER committee. Yes, super helpful. Haven't had a, uh, an opportunity yet. Um, a new director, yes, that's a challenge um, when there's turnover in the leadership and you have to start building those bridges all over again. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, an example of a Follette store that has active representation on the textbook affordability campus. Yay. Wow. These are great. You know, I feel like generally bookstores are, are have been good about recognizing that OER is just part of their survival strategy. And so at least in my case, having conversations with bookstores, it's been very positive. Like they just want to understand and they want to be involved. Right. Uh, in talking with our bookstore, leadership, they say the textbooks are not their big money makers. They make far more money from the wildcat gear that they sell and the Clinique makeup counter uh, than they do from textbooks. And so they've been a really willing partner uh, in, in lowering costs in multiple ways. Textbook data, yes. Um, Kim mentions collaborating with the bookstore to get some data, which they can compare against collections. That's really interesting. Um, I also, I have to just second that because the tech, uh, the bookstore does have a lot of data that you could use. They could tell you, you know, the sciences generally cost this much. The social sciences generally cost this much. Um, they can even get very granular to particular professors who might be assigning a wildly expensive book that you maybe want to know about. Maybe you don't, um, but they really do have a lot of data that can be useful. Oh, Will mentions print on demand for OER. Um, yes. yes, that's a really great opportunity to partner if they're using OpenStax content. Uh, our bookstore will sell print copies of it. And then if it's used the next semester, they're able to uh, buy the, the OpenStax print books back from students and resell them as used at an even lower cost the next semester. But yeah, print on demand, if they have the equipment to do that, that's an excellent partnership and, and a real win for the, the bookstore. Oh, great. Somebody mentions the National Association of College Stores. Uh, they're a great resource. Um, they run the textbook affordability conferences that I mentioned. And so I've ended up on their, their listserv. And it's a fascinating look at the inside communications among bookstore managers and what they're dealing with and not fans of Pearson's new customer service model, I have to say. Um, but you can really get a taste of, of what issues um, they're they're wrestling with and where there might be some potential partnerships where you could help each other out. I mean, when you think about it, just ideologically, you know, they also get complaints from students about the textbook cost, right? So it's, it's in their interest to be able to say, we're doing something about that, you know? So I think Philip had a question about why is it part of their, or it, example in which, in which it's a part of their survival strategy. I would say that's one example, you know, they're the front lines that students, you know, when they're buying their textbook and seeing the incredible number that, number that they're paying, they complain to the bookstore. And so um, they're invested in making affordability possible. Oh, I see Marilyn's, uh chat comment about several have mentioned 
library providing access to ebook versions of textbooks mm -hmm. we're having no luck finding ebook versions so uh, a big chunk of my job in addition to oer is coordinating our course driven acquisitions program that provides these library licensed ebooks and in the years that we've been doing it we've found that less than 20 percent of the titles are available from publishers to academic libraries as multi-user ebooks and so that's a problem on the publisher side. Uh, we keep voicing our frustration to our, our primary ebook providers, um, ProQuest and uh, EBSCO. Uh, they say they, with the COVID pandemic, they are seeing a, a, some more willingness from publishers to make their textbooks available as ebooks. Um, but generally it's a you know they're in the business of making money and if they think they can make more money selling directly to students they just won't make the ebook license available to libraries the other problem we run into there is uh the availability can change on a dime the unlimited user license will be there one day and gone the next so uh yeah there's some challenges with that for sure Oh, these are great comments. Thank you. We should, in, this, in the interest of time, probably move on to the next question. Have you partnered with instructional designers in your teaching and learning center? If you're doing a learning community or a learning circle, what is it covered and how is it structured? Instructional designers are something we only dream about. Yes. They're, they're fairly new on our campus. They've been fantastic partners, but they are fairly new only in the past couple of years. Oh, Mandy says we got permission to offer a short course online for faculty in our learning management system and offer a stipend. Nice. Amazing. That's a great idea. That's a fantastic idea, Mandy. Is that uh, CC licensed? Yes, I would love to see <laughs> how it was structured. I'll say that with our uh, learning community, we've uh, covered a lot of faculty questions about copyright and fair use. I just shared with them the recording of the session that Will and, and other folks did was it yesterday? The week is a blur. I think it was yesterday. It was a fantastic presentation about fair use and OER. And they used great case study examples. And Will had great analogies, how fair use is like soup, um, that make the content really relatable. Because I could tell after I gave my presentation the day before, they still had a lot of questions about fair use and copyright and how all of that worked. Uh, we get a lot of questions about images and what can I use in my course, what can I use, you know, in a press book um, that I'm creating. So uh, those kinds of resources and, and OER discovery resources are something that we've also uh, emphasized in our learning community. Faculty inquiry groups, Bridget says. Ooh, Jennifer also has a Canvas course in OER. Jennifer, is that CC licensed? Oh, these are fantastic comments.
And just as a reminder, we are going to have these compiled. So if anybody is starting to get nervous <laughs> that they're not writing fast enough. Yes, I'm having trouble getting through all of them. There's so many good ones. It's telling me there are 25 that I have not yet read. <laughs> Oh, yes, Michelle, uh, share the fair use webinar link with the, you, definitely. Oh, Tanya says uh, it'll be posted on the OTN's YouTube site. It actually is on the, I because I shared out the link to it this morning. Oh, Andrew mentions distance education, yes. Ooh, Phil mentions a curriculum innovation camp. That sounds very cool. At a conference, I heard somebody um, talk about a, a summer program where they offered in-person one-on-one uh, -on -one help with instructional design and OER support. So I thought that was really cool. Oh gosh, okay, we better move on to the next topic. <laughs> but thank you for all of those great suggestions and comments. Uh, if you're doing course marking, what challenges have you run into? What barriers exist to implementing the process? I'll say that for us, it's been a technology challenge uh, and, a, and an administrative challenge. Uh, I've, I've broached the idea and was told, no way, we're not touching our system, <laughs> our registration system. Uh, that particular administrator is now gone, so we're hoping we'll get some traction with a new administrator. Jeannie mentions, yes, talking to politics, couldn't get support coming from the faculty to the faculty, but when your um, student government association, or is that staff or government association took it up? Student, yes, yes. We found that ideas are um, much more influential with higher ups when they're coming from students rather than coming from a librarian. And then another option is just to have it as an opt-in feature because each department might feel very differently about it. And so here at least, I don't think, I think we're many years away from having that as like a blanket uh, procedure, but political science, for instance, is happy to go into their uh, registrar system and add a little note about the courses because they care maybe more or uh, maybe they've, they're getting more pushback from students. I don't know exactly, but even if you could get some departments to agree to it, uh, that might be one win. And maybe working with provost, yes, that would be good. Mary mentions one of the big hurdles is that faculty aren't consistent about reporting their textbook adoptions in a timely fashion. Huge, huge problem on our campus. And they've tried all kinds of different incentives, emails from the provost, uh, bonus payments to departments for on-time <laughs> textbook adoptions. And still, it's just really tough. I, I've heard of one campus where they would not list the course in the registration system until the faculty had submitted their textbook adoption, uh, which wow. I don't see us doing, but I thought, <laughs> wow, that, that, would, that would work. Uh, we try to leverage the Higher Education Opportunity Act because it does say that students are supposed to be able to see the cost of their course materials when they register for a class. So we'll say, hey guys, this is a federal legislation. Uh, but yeah, it's it's tough. And a I lot have, of, sorry, Shara, but a lot of, there's a lot of legislation out there right now. Um, so definitely take a look in your respective states because um, 
those are wonderful ideas and it, it, it does change a conversation because then the university is at least required to say what they're doing about affordability and putting something in the registrar is a relatively easy, I guess, way <laughs> of at least saying that they're doing something about affordability. So. Don mentions doing a survey and finding a lot of mistrust between faculty and bookstore. Yes, I've heard that too, uh, where they, they don't trust the bookstore to have the best prices. And so they're sending students to Amazon instead. Uh, and, and that's part of the educational efforts where I think the library or uh, your whichever unit you work in um, can partner with the bookstore to educate faculty. What we t say is, look, students, if they buy through the bookstore, they can use their bursar account uh, and use financial aid to pay for their purchases. Uh, they don't get charged sales tax by our bookstore on textbook purchases. And uh, you know, by submitting your textbook adoptions on time, the bookstore is much more likely to be able to find used print copies and other um, other cost saving, you know, uh, alternatives for students than if you totally circumvent the bookstore at all. Uh, we actually had to write into our policy, please do not circumvent the bookstore, uh, because a lot were contracting with outside sites like Top Hats, and, and that was causing issues for students who didn't, didn't have a credit card or a debit card. Um, they, you know, one was required to buy from Top Hat or whatever the outside website was. Let's see. Okay, let's go to the next one. How can we keep students engaged in advocacy over time? Um, for example, dealing with turnover in student governments and involving the perks. And Elaine had a really good um, comment about that early on. So let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, the idea is to uh, help with student government continuity, encourage your student government leadership to build in an appointed student government position for an OER rep. So this would be a good position for a second year student, and then that student can, can mentor the incoming student. I think that's wonderful. I've also heard the suggestion um, for the outgoing student government rep to provide some training or onboarding to the incoming member um, so that the, there's some continuity, continuity there. Uh, also having specific student government positions maybe related to textbook affordability or other issues um, where they may tend to stay for multiple years. We want faculty to sit down with our students and hear what they have to say about textbook classes. Students feel heard. Yes, and faculty get the impact of the student's struggles to pay for course, oops, it moved. Course materials. Um, trying to get that going for the fall. Yes, um, I, I've noticed that there is a disconnect with some faculty on the impact and the barrier that high textbook costs cause. Uh, we actually had a, a library development director who was in charge of fundraising and one of the ideas was could you fundraise for OER projects and she came back and said yeah I'm not going to be able to pitch that to donors because they're going to say that if we save students money on textbooks they're just going to spend it on beer and my jaw <laughs> dropped. <laughs> I thought, Wow. <laughs> oh, okay. Let, 
not even dealing with the privilege involved in that assumption, you know, let's let's talk about the realities for students on our campus and the fact that a third have food insecurity and we don't even know the percentage that are dealing with housing insecurity. Um, but we definitely do notice a disconnect um, where faculty one assume that students are buying the textbooks they're assigning and they're not and and two not realizing what a barrier especially when they um, require the courseware which often costs a hundred dollars or more what a barrier that is for student retention success Oh, Don says, presented at the first student government meeting in the last year. That's a great idea. Ooh, I love the idea of having OER drop-in sessions uh, during the summer for faculty via Zoom where you can talk about the why of faculty adoption of OER rather than the how. And hope to have a student panel. Yes, student panels can be, uh, especially during open access week or open ed week, those can be so impactful. Okay, I believe we have one, at least one more. Uh, if you're working on promotion and tenure, PNT guidelines, where, how did you start? to make any leeway there in my institution. And why is that? Um, I think it's because I don't know where to start, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, there's so many, uh, it's such a massive process and nobody's particularly in charge of it. Um, and it doesn't get revised very often. So it's a, it's a tough one. Oh, I love the idea Mandy suggests of a teaching award. Um, and, and that's one of the things that faculty can put on their CV and include in their dossier. Um, hey, I I, I'm a, uh, an OER champion, or I'm a textbook hero, or I received this award, or I received this uh, grant, uh, faculty report grants that they receive in their dossier. So even if your grant is $200 or your stipend is $200, that's still something that they can add to their dossier for promotion and tenure. Ooh, Jennifer says, able to meet with the provost, um, going to include it in all offer letters for new faculty hires. But for faculty who are already under contract, it will be up to individual departments to write it into their P&T documents. Uh, we run into that as well, where uh, departmental policies are very specific and wide ranging. You know, I wonder, um, so somebody had mentioned something about the union. This is giving me an idea that at the very least at my institution, so we might not be able to provide this idea for all tenant promotion tenure and promotion, but we do have input on how librarians are promoted and tenured um, every five or six years. And so uh, I wonder if just starting with one contract, 
you know, um, which would make sense to start with us, <laughs> might be introducing that idea to the larger community as, you know, how tenure and promotion works here, you know, you see outside eyes have to look at your um, materials. So, you know, a professor in biology would be looking into in mine and things like that. So that just gave me an idea. So it's exciting. Thane says, we had a recent committee formed to evaluate and update tenure and promotion. So I kept persistently telling the chair I was interested and got myself appointed. Yay. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Getting on some of those key committees can be really impactful. So well done. Uh, Lane says they're not allowed to call the funding for OER grants. Same yeah. Here. Uh, I learned that the hard way. <laughs> how so? Uh, well, we were calling it grants for like a year and then got the word that that is inappropriate, I guess. I mean, I think it's the word grant means something different to a business admin than it does to the rest of us. So lesson learned. Don't call it a grant. Yes, yeah, stipend. I, we call it an award right now. And I had to fight for award too. That was a tough one to, but you know, when you call it a, like they wanted to call it a research fund here, which means nothing <laughs> to a lot of people. So it's like, I know it's a technical word, but if you're going to have people apply to these things, it should be more descriptive than research fund. I've had, uh folks reach out and ask how to report OER publications that they've published uh, as scholarship. And so that the idea of how to deal with that on your campus is something that you might think about in advance and provide some guidance on. There, oh, one more, one more category. Um, since I see we are running out of time here, but what are examples of ways you've partnered with disability services and student success centers? I love all the things you've shared in the chat. An hour goes by so fast. Or if they're, um, if you don't currently partner with uh, your disability services or student success centers, um, are there other campus partners that we haven't covered that you could, su could suggest reaching out to? Go ahead and put those in the chat. Ooh, cultural center, LGBTQ center. That's a great idea. Yeah, sometimes it's just, uh it's just a matter of cross promotion too, you know, just being able to um, spread the word, you know. Phil suggests department level faculty development committees. Yes. I have so much better luck going to faculty department meetings than asking faculty to come to us for a workshop. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Human Resources Success Center. I hadn't thought of that. Ah, Pamela says the State Regents Online Learning Group. Yeah, working with um, other partners in your, your state. Ooh, Native American Success Center. Diversity and inclusion, that's a good one that we're missing. Yes, these are awesome suggestions. 
tutoring center director. Yes. Oh, these are fantastic suggestions. Um, I am saving the chat and we will compile these into a Google Doc and share them out with you along with some of the requested links um, that people have asked about for things like the um, course marking uh, book that's out, um, the, a link to the like the Higher Education Opportunity Act and some of the other links that people have requested. So I will um, I don't know if I can email the whole group, but I will get this to Tanya so she can email everybody. And we are at time. Oh my goodness. Thank you all for, for participating. Uh, this was great. I learned a lot and got some new ideas. So thank you so I much. I agree. This was really wonderful. And I, I look forward to continuing the conversation if we can through the Google Doc and just getting to know each other and the the ways in which we work with campus partners. Oh, and it's Friday, so happy Friday. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Lily. Thank you to everyone. I'm excited to see the document um, and I'll put all the links. I can email it to you and then um, I'll make sure that the transcript and that this video gets onto the uh, Canvas course shell, okay? All right, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you again. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Lily. Bye. 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 Yes, happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. Yes.